there's a concept in Philo uh, we see of a divine intermediary figure. Um, it's not just in Philo, obviously. It's 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 in the Mediterranean antiquity in general. The concept of this divine intermediary incarnating and and uh, assuming, you know, the uh, the historical figure. Like you see that in Osiris and Egyptian pharaohs. You see it in uh, Hermes Augustus for uh, and Horus um, and for the gentlemen we're talking about today, Philo of Alexandria, um, that's probably best exemplified in um, Moses, um, who is an incarnation of the uh, the word. Uh, so if you could kind of elaborate on that. Give a little background here. I, I think you can see how Philo is, is distinct. Um, everyone knows that Philo is a Platonist and that he read Plato. And so... Philo's theory of the soul has some, obviously, overlaps with Plato. And I basically see Platonists, and Earl can correct me if I'm wrong, I basically see Platonists as working with three types of, of soul. There, there could be more. But basically, uh, for all of us in a body, for all of us who are incarnate, we pre-existed at some point point and we fell into bodies this is the myth of the phaedrus where you know you're on your chariot there's two horses one is really unruly and uh messes things up and you know we were riding you know on a one horse open sleigh as it were after our you know native god and we fell we fell into a body and some of us one type of us fell so hard that our entire life is completely consumed by material concerns and the things of sense perception. So uh, food and sleep and sex, and that's pretty much what we think about. We binge on TV or you know Netflix or whatever, and that's how we live our lives. And we never really think about anything higher than the material world. So that's the one type of soul, the, the fallen soul who is so sunk down that they're never going to go back up. And then there is the soul who is realizes or has a memory, as, as Plato puts it, of, of something better, of a real transcendent world, and is able to break out of the matrix, to use that example. And that takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of aesthetic and moral effort. And eventually, maybe after several lives of transmigrating, you know, Plato says that, you know, you might need to do this, you know, 10 times, maybe a thousand times. I mean, philosophers, they can do it in three rounds, but it takes a while. But eventually, yeah, you graduate out of your, out of the cycle of transmigration, out of your body, and you, you re-enter the divine realm into the train of the gods and everything's good. And then there's the type of soul that never in, incarnate. It's because they never fall. They, there's no pre-existent fall. They are able to keep their horses in line. They're following in the train of the deity and everything's cool. I mean, they're not quite at the level of the deity, obviously. They might bob up and down on the rim of the universe, but that's who they are. And so for Philo, the soul of Moses, he's not the Logos, that would that would be way too high, but, but for Philo's Moses is one of those souls that is following very closely in the train of the Logos. <clears throat> So for in the Phaedrus, you remember, the royal souls are following Zeus. For Philo, the, the chorus leader, as it were, would be the elder angel, who is the Logos. And Moses is following so Moses' soul. He's not yet Moses, okay, but his, his soul, his pre-existent soul is following along in that train, okay, following the Logos so closely that he does not fall and does not feel any need or desire to enter into a material body. And so that, I think, is what makes sense of Philo's language, because he's not, <clears throat> he doesn't really expand very much. He doesn't like to talk about pre-existence of souls. He doesn't like to talk about transmigration. But I think that he believes both. Um, and because these aren't book? explicitly biblical... Have you? Sorry. Yes, yeah, Sammy. Really sorry um, yeah. Yes, yeah, Sammy's book. I've I've got a book review on my YouTube channel. Uh, Transmigration in in Philo. Or sorry, it's reincarnation in Philo, and it's a yeah, fantastic it's on my list. book. <clears throat> and, yeah, he, yeah, makes, so, he makes the argument as about as strong as you can make it. 
and it's pretty definitely <clears throat> yeah it's it's a great example of of scholarly rigor and so that's already on 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 youtube i highly recommend that book to to everybody and basically what we have is a case where a soul who did not need to be incarnated decided to be incarnated and this is what makes philo different than plato because i think if plato were thinking about this and you know we don't have him here and and it, this isn't explicit in any of his texts so I'm, I'm i'm interpreting here obviously but for plato if 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 you are a soul that never feels the need never feels the pull toward the material world you never go you are never incarnated and for you to be incarnated would be a mistake that's why Platonists had such a problem with the incarnation of jesus incarnation is such a waste of time well, not only a waste of time for a soul who does not need it, but it's a defilement, right? I mean, it's 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 a dirty, disgusting, defiling experience to enter into a mortal husk. And you wouldn't do that unless you fell involuntarily. But what we have here is a tradition where a soul who does not fall yet decides for a saving purpose to be sent, as Philo puts it, loaned, loaned to earth for a specific mission in which this soul is already a divine soul so he doesn't need to have the same practice he doesn't need to have the same struggle that all of the rest of us have or or, or i should say that subset of souls who is striving to conquer the body and to rise out of this flesh suit um and that is why Moses is a child, as he puts it in the life of Moses, is why people looked at his, him as a child and said, is this, is this kid human, divine, or a mix of both? If he's a mix of both, which I think is actually Philo's answer, then he's somehow daimonic, okay? Mm -hmm. That he's somehow angelic. He's, he's not a full-fledged god okay um you know philo does talk about the deification of moses and then, yes i do have an article <clears throat> on this which is on my patreon the deification of moses definitely philo does not mince words okay but i think what what philo means by the deification of moses you know where he says he became a god by ascending not to the sky or but but to the realm above the sky uh, and where he stood with the existent forever uh, after his after his death and as a sort of proleptic moment at Sinai. Moses is deified, but what Philo means by that is he becomes something like an angel. And Philo clarifies that in, in his book uh, on giants, uh, that the divine soul, the angel, and the daimon, what the Greeks call the daimon, are but different the, names for the same yeah. underlying entity. And yeah. it's this that shows you that he is talking about a specific subset of the divine class that Moses was before his incarnation and to which he returns. Angels are logoi. They are made up of the same noetic stuff as logos. And when Moses dies, he doesn't really die, in, in, in the life of Moses, 2, 288, he enters into this whirlwind and his material elements are spun off of him and he rises as a noose, which uh, Philo uses this word, heliodestros, or uh, heliodestitos. His noose, most like the sun, rises as if it's beamed upward exactly where I think it came. So where is where is Philo getting this tradition? I don't think it's from Plato. And this is really the, the key, which I, I try to argue in chapter five of my book, Post-Human Transformation. He gets this from traditions uh, which are more native to Egypt, in which we see in the Hermetica, um, I, I'm not claiming that he's reading the Hermetica directly, but I am claiming that this idea of a, a king 
typically an ancient king, but sometimes a modern one, sent to Earth as a civilizing force, like, like Osiris, sent here for a specific and definite mission purpose, but didn't need to be here. They're only here to help us, you know. So that idea, it's not a Platonic idea. It's, it's a ruler cult idea. It's, an, it's a native Egyptian idea. And it's also her, a hermetic idea, which we see most clearly in the Kori Cosmo, which is the Sobe and Hermetic of 23. And yeah, I've got all those translated and I make my argument in, in post-human transformation. I don't think every Philonist is going to be happy with that argument, but that's what I say. So, <laughs> yeah, of you know, you know, I was just reading today um, the the pseudo Clementines, which I highly recommend. It's, I mean, it's a it's a huge mess, and I had say third century, maybe fourth century, in the form we have them, uh, two different texts, but they're basically versions of the same text, and they're Jewish Christian texts right and in these texts we have the belief in the true prophet who is like basically some kind of angelic being that that incarnates periodically in earthly life and does awesome stuff so the first one was adam uh the pseudo clementines don't give us any other names along the way but it's it's implied you know your moses is and stuff like that would definitely be there and then jesus is the most recent one so this is one entity that's this sort of salvific, periodically appearing entity that reincarnates over and over. We see this in Manichaeism as well. We see this in... Um, Sethianism. Sethianism Seth too. Seth. Seth. Okay. Seth yeah, is reincarnated. Yeah. yeah. So that's all good. of these um, Near Eastern, but like definitely... Yeah. So where does this come from if it comes from one source? Like it feels like the problem I'm having in my mind right now trying to think about it, I'm trying to, you know, is this hermetic? Is he right? He probably is right, but let's just think of other options. Um, I know of all these Jewish traditions about a figure like this, and they go right forward in rabbinic literature to modern times, but do they go back? How far back do they go? That's always the problem with rabbinic traditions and, uh, you know, imperial era Jewish traditions, because our evidence gets really weak the further back you go. So that's a that's really, really interesting idea. Um, I, one thing I wanted, to, if I may, is um, oh, yeah. I love what you say about the, the platonic model of the descent of the soul. And, and it's spot on. But there is this really interesting exception, which is Iamblichus. And then people who follow Iamblichus, he takes the exact opposite line, right? Now, then we might want to ask, what kind of influences there, are there on, his, on Iamblichus's Platonism? Like... I mean, he does say it's Egyptian wisdom. He does, you know, in the De Mysteries, this, he's an Egyptian priest. So there's an e Egypt connection there for sure. But he's saying uh, incarnation is fantastic and matter is full of the, the, the one itself is, is present in matter. Like everything, all the higher levels are present at all the lower levels or, you know, present and non-present at the same time. They're, they're imminent to while transcending. Um, and... The, the philosopher's souls, the ones who, when they leave the human body, are hanging out in the world of forms with the, you know, in the train of the gods, they come Love back it. on purpose for, out of compassion for humans because they need to bring the divine down to this world. So they're like these, yep. you know, Platonist bodhisattva figures. Yes, which absolutely. Which is an interestingly analogous, related idea, though not the same thing. That Philo is saying, Amblich is being being attracted into this this broader tradition, and it's not just Hermetic. It, it's it's just that the Cory Cosmo is such a good example and an instance of this, where it, it it does seem to be very ancient uh, Egyptian, possibly all is Jewish as well. I mean, the Jews are in Egypt for such a long time that yeah, an, an ancient king and civilizer a redeemer mm. in Christian language is sent for a distinct and specific uh, mission. And once that's accomplished, they, they rise up. And, and you see this in poetry with, with Horace. Horace is the same thing about Augustus. Um, mm. And uh, so, it, I mean, it, it's, it's in the air 
and and it's not like we could pinpoint you know here's where this idea comes from but yeah iamblichus is 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 being influenced by that and it's it's one it's one small way where you could really say maybe kind of sort of here's where iamblichus really is uh he's not just impersonating an egyptian priest he actually is dependent on native egyptian traditions yeah i'm i feel that i think that is that is a good place to say that i think there are so many places you can say that you know the i know almost nothing about egyptology but everything i learned just makes me, oh it's like yamblicus <laughs> you know like the so much of it so the um i think the reaction against uh egyptomania in scholarship has been has bent the stick too far in the other direction and we just need more people who read all the different egyptian scripts and greek and latin to kind of bridge that gap <laughs>